Coming up, a team of young Central Florida engineers hopes to change the way pilots learn to fly. It has potential to revolutionize the industry of flight simulation. And a Pennsylvania company is pushing the boundaries of commercial space exploration. We've been preparing for this test for the last four years. This is the culmination of a lot of hard work. Exploring the frontiers of science. Probing cutting edge technologies. Seeking answers to the big questions. Welcome to SciTech Central. Learning to fly has never been a quick or inexpensive proposition, but four recent college graduates are hoping to make it easier, cheaper, and more efficient, all while they're learning how to build a business. There are nearly 620,000 FAA certified pilots in the U.S. That may sound like a lot, but since 1980, the number has dropped by 25%, while the population has grown 40%. One reason is the ever-increasing expense of training. It now costs about $10,000 to obtain a private pilot's license, the most common certification. A group of young Central Florida engineers is developing a flight simulator that may help change that. The name of our simulator is the IFS Eagle. It stands for Immersive Flight Simulator. The simulator is a new groundbreaking flight training device that bridges the gap between personal computer trainers and really expensive, bulky, full flight simulators. Brandon and his partners are using off-the-shelf hardware and software, but combining them in a novel fashion. What's new about the simulator is that we're integrating new virtual reality technology that just hit the market. It's affordable, it's immersive, and it's high definition. Virtual reality applications have been used for years, but the visual perception of motion without the right physical sensations often causes nausea and other unpleasant effects. By integrating the virtual reality with the motion, it allows the user to operate the training device for extended periods of time without getting disoriented. The Talon Simulator offers two major advantages over existing flight simulators. This is a portable full motion simulator. Usually a full motion simulator would fill this whole hangar with the equipment and they're millions of dollars. Talon's product is price range at about $20,000 and it's completely portable. A flying instructor, if he's portable, would be able to pack up the simulator, take it to a different airport, set up for about 30, 45 minutes. So the potential is there, he can move around to two or three airports in one day. The simulator is also designed to make the training process more efficient for aspiring pilots. It really immerses them in the aerial environment so that you can reduce anxiety when you get into the aircraft. You learn uh, procedures and policies on the ground that way you can maximize your time up in the plane. The project originated while the partners were still undergrads. The simulator all began for our mechanical senior design project at the University of Central Florida. The summer before the class started, we put together a team, we found some funding, and we got the idea approved. What I liked about the project, it was relevance to today's technologies and training opportunities for those who want to do some pilot training. I have a pilot's license myself and I could relate to their project, so I was able to give them even better inputs and feedback. Since completing college, the Talon partners have continued to refine the simulator. These are AC induction motors and uh, they're driven by frequency drive amps and that was a different motor control than what our very first project was. This is more of an industrial application for high fidelity, so it's a lot more a higher reliable system. We'll be adding more degrees of adjustability to our simulator with our next prototype and that will include adjustability with the legs, um, with the yoke mount, and with the throttle quadrant as well as where the seat will be positioned. But as with all great ideas, the road from prototype to commercial product is a long and arduous journey. Talon is part of a UCF program that aims to transform promising student projects into viable business enterprises. As part of the National Science Foundation Innovation Core program, it's a 10-week course. We, every week we go and talk to customers and report our findings back to these instructors who critique us and help us learn the business side of things, which has been really beneficial for a group of engineers who have little to zero knowledge on that. 
just kind of teaches us engineering students to venture out and go talk to people and network and to get a different experience. As part of that outreach, the talent team attends public events like Atronicon at the Orlando Science Center. We're collecting data basically on who is riding it, the amount of people, their age group, and their experience, whether they're a pilot or not, and then uh, the amount of nausea, if any, that they were developing from it. We had 460 people use it, with only 3% of people getting any sort of nausea. 20% of them actually ended up being pilots, so it was really beneficial to get their feedback. If these young engineers can reach the end of their long road, their simulator could have a major impact. It has potential to revolutionize the industry of flight simulation. Any individual that is desiring to obtain a, a pilot license or more training, it will make that training that much more affordable and more people will be more interested in getting the pilot's license. The talent engineers see their mission in even loftier terms. For the future, I'm really hoping to see us grow into the next generation of simulation and training. We really want to be a part of the growth of the industry and we want to save lives and change lives. There are many types of simulators, and the Orlando Public Library is making several of them available to the entire Central Florida community. Hi, and welcome to the Melrose Center, a 26,000 square foot state-of-the-art facility featuring audio, video, and photo studios, as well as simulators and a fab lab here in downtown Orlando at the Orlando Public Library. We have had a number of people report that they're using the simulators and then they're taking those skills out into the real world. Our two simulators for heavy equipment, the forklift simulator as well as the earth excavator, have been used and directly have led uh, to people getting the skills they need uh, to find jobs in those fields. In the simulation lab, as well as throughout the Melrose Center, every area is taught and staffed by individuals who are experts in their field. Almost 50 years after Apollo 11, there's a new moon race. Astrobotic, a Pennsylvania company competing for the Google Lunar X Prize, recently completed an important test at the Mojave Air and Spaceport in California. Reporter Tim Stevens fills us in. Welcome to the middle of the Mojave Desert, more specifically, the Mojave Air and Spaceport. This is where 10 years ago, Scaled Composites won the Ansari X Prize with its Spaceship One. And if all goes according to plan this week, this is where Astrobotic, the team from Pittsburgh, will be taking its next step toward winning the Google Lunar X Prize. This is a very important uh, historic place for X Prize. In 2008, I believe it was, uh, Maston Space Systems, where we are today, was the winner of the Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander Challenge, which was uh, in fact the same, the very same vehicle you see behind me, which is going to be used by, uh, by Astrobotic for this test. We've been preparing for this test for the last uh, four years about. Uh, this is uh, the culmination of a lot of hard work. I did the visual navigation. But we'll use a camera on board the lander and it takes pictures and I take the images and match them to a map. Each pixel in that map or each square in the map corresponds to some value in the real world, so latitude, longitude. I can use the image data, match up to the map and then figure out where we are in 3D space using that data. So we can figure out where the lander is just using a single camera image and a map. Now we're standing on the place where the test itself should end, hopefully successfully. The lander is going to take off about 300 meters in that direction, go straight up and then glide in at about a 25 degree angle. As it comes in, the lander is going to be using laser scanners to point straight down and figure out where the best place for it to touch down is. There are three concrete paths behind me. The lander itself will determine which of those is the best for it to use. You'll see the sandbags scattered around. Those are basically simulating boulders on the lunar surface. Obviously, it doesn't want to touch down on any of those. It's going to avoid those, pick the right concrete pad, and touch down gently. 
it, it could be quite difficult. They really haven't done it before commercially. They've done some prior tests uh, to this, so they have some pretty good confidence. But in general, uh, commercial companies don't normally do this. It's the R&D realm. We're landing near the Lacus Mortis pit on the moon. Uh, it's much rougher terrain than uh, where Apollo landed or any of the older Mars landings. We want to guarantee that we're going to be safe when we touch down. This test is just one component of Astrobotics overall lander development and mission development. The other sorts of things which the team is going to have to do before it can launch and land on the moon is complete the development of the other subsystems of its lander. So there's propulsion subsystems, the structural subsystem, communications and things like that. So the judging panel is looking at those kinds of things as well. And eventually Astrobotics is going to have to buy a ride to the moon. Despite a series of setbacks, the Google Lunar X Prize judges were able to evaluate the Team Astrobotic landing system with Maston here in the desert, and ultimately we're still waiting to hear exactly whether or not that's enough to win them the milestone prize, but it was a big step forward in their ultimate plans for landing on the moon. Astrobotics is actually going to fly other teams to the surface of the moon, so there's no other team that is actually going to do that for the other teams. Uh, so that's an interesting approach. So they're taking other payloads with them as well as their own. For me personally, I'd really like to see my software be useful for pinpoint landing. That's really exciting. I'm Tim Stevens covering the Google Lunar X Prize for CNN. At Orlando's Oak Ridge High School, a magnet program is addressing the growing need for commercial pilots and aerospace engineers by giving students real-world training. The first year program that I teach is the simulation. The second year program, we start getting them onto radio-controlled airplanes. In my third year, the student will actually come in and build their own aircraft. They determine was the construction worthwhile, did the plane work for what I wanted it to do. What we were doing was taxiing the plane, which is just learning how to maneuver your plane on the ground. I want to be a mechanical engineer, I want to build aircraft, so I'm not too much of a flyer, so I like to be in class making the decision and the measurements of the aircraft and swing it. We were inspecting an oil rig and as we were landing there was an explosion. We had the option of rescuing the three people that were in the rig or letting the Coast Guard yeah, take care of it. Gone. You can't land there. It's teaching me how to think critically, stuff that happens in real life. Next, an aerospace museum that's using hot air balloons, robotics, and hands-on learning to amuse, educate, and inspire kids to take to the skies. My name is Andrew Parton. I'm the executive director at the Cradle of Aviation Museum and Education Center. The people you meet here, whether they're little kids or they're senior citizens or veterans, this is a museum that excites them all. Cradle of Aviation opened in 2002. Prior to that, it was a labor of love of historians and, and aviation enthusiasts who were collecting a lot of aircraft and artifacts. Its mission is to really use the museum uh, as a way to excite kids about science and technology. Seven years ago, the Cradle of Aviation Museum partnered with the Westbury School District to form a STEM Magnet Academy. Our students come here every day, and they spend a half a day here. They take their science, math, and technology courses here. The Westbury students really are the foundation of why we're so great at what we do. You know, it's a testament to how good education can be in an informal atmosphere. They're learning theory in a physical classroom space here at the museum, but then they're going into the museum exploring the exhibits and artifacts. It's really nice to see them engaged in a way that they can create something and understand the science behind it. So in a classroom where you might just be lectured to by a teacher or they might get a little dry reading out of a textbook, we get to apply the same concepts but have them walk away with something that they can hold. I was part of the first class for the Creative Aviation Magnet Academy. Through it I um, got to learn a lot about how science and technology, engineering, arts and mathematics all connect to each other and it wasn't I got to this program, I took a robotics class, I learned that I love programming, and that's why I'm studying science. I want to be right now. 
he's really been taking on a whole new world for STEM for us. The fact that he was able to take some of that robotics programming that he learned while he was here and correlate into a computer science career for himself is a really nice correlation to see between the two of us. We have what's called STEM partnerships, and that's where we work closely with the school district to have multiple visits of classes here at the museum, and then we go out to the school in an outreach effort to kind of integrate the museum's science and technology programs into their curriculum. We have a number of contests, uh, all tied in with science and technology, and a lot of them are mostly engineering-based. We are the regional site for the Rube Goldberg Engineering Competition. The imagination and the creativity they have to put into these things is pretty amazing to see. For the elementary schools, we have an egg drop. Kids have to drop their eggs safely landed on the ground in a contraption that they built. My favorite program that I think we've been running is Kid Win. The kids have to build a wind turbine at school and they work with their teachers and their classmates to create it. Sometimes math and science courses can be really boring, but here it's a little bit more exciting. Our students benefit very much by the fact that they have such exposure to so many things when they come here. We've had probably about 120 students graduate now from high school since we've started the program and uh, all of them are in college and most of them are majoring in the STEM areas. The first flight was in 1903. Only 66 years later we landed a man on the moon. Technology today is operating much faster than even that 66 year period of time. And for museums, especially in education, uh, the difficulty is keeping up with it. So we've been trying to incorporate as much new technologies we can. One of the things we've been looking at and are kind of rolling out will be an app for the museum. Something that you can use when you come here uh, that will kind of give you a guided tour yourself. So it will allow people remotely to access the archives of the museum and photographs and historic uh, milestones that we might be highlighting. You don't have to wait for a teacher to tell you what's out there. You can go home and do that by yourself and kind of build your own blocks to make your own future. All the studies and all the research has kind of shown that uh, here in the United States we're falling behind everybody else as it relates to kids getting involved in science and technology careers. And if we're falling behind, we need to do something to stimulate that interest in kids. I think there's a lot of opportunity out there as we look to go to Mars and we look to explore further into space. As careers start to change in that technical aspect and people start to understand what coding is and how to create your own apps and how to build within one another to make a kind of cornerstone for the future will definitely reflect in the careers that are coming up. To be relevant in today's world we really need to make kids get excited. Hopefully they're inspired by everything here to look at science and math careers. I'm working at the planetarium. I'm working on 3D modeling and um, animations. I've always had an interest in computer graphics, so not only have I, um, do I have an opportunity to give back to the place that got me to where I am now, but um, I'm also advancing my learning to use in the future, hopefully in another career. Just seeing the everyday that goes on and the heart and soul that Andy and the staff put into the foundations of the museum to make it a forward and progressive moving facility for our students in 21st century learning is great. An increasing number of schools across the country are focusing on STEM instruction. A novel teaching method is gaining traction as educators try to help students make sense of complex science and math topics. Reporter Andrea Vasquez has the story. As a high school physics student, Seth Gunyal's Kupperman enjoyed the subject, but not the way it was taught. I was kind of frustrated. I don't just want to watch my physics teacher do physics in front of us. I want to do some physics. Can we do some physics, please? Now a teacher at a math and science-focused high school, Gunyal's Kupperman found the antidote in modeling instruction an approach to teaching that relies less on lectures and textbooks and more on students' hands-on experiments. Instead of having students kind of quietly do work cloistered by themselves, they're conversing, they're deducing, they're problem solving, they're sharing. It really moves us to be learners together uh, rather than just kind of passive receivers of knowledge. The United States ranks 25th in mathematics and 17th in science among industrialized nations, a standing the Obama administration calls unacceptable. 
Gunyal's Kupperman is among a growing number of educators who think modeling instruction can help change that. He and teachers from around the country and across the world gave up three weeks this summer to attend one of the workshops that the American Modeling Teachers Association helped put on in 20 states and three countries. About 10 percent of the physics teachers in the country have gone through a modeling workshop and a fair fraction of the chemistry teachers. There are probably well over 1,700 teachers that are members of the American Modeling Teachers Association, and its membership curve is going up pretty steeply. From 2010 to 2020, the U.S. Department of Education projects double-digit increases in the number of STEM jobs, but it reports that only 16 percent of high school seniors are proficient in math and interested in a STEM career. Seeing the growing need, science educators developed modeling instruction, and the American Modeling Teachers Association was formed to train teachers to bring it into their classrooms. The method aims to help students essentially do science rather than memorize facts. We collect evidence, we analyze it, we see some patterns in it. Can we use these patterns to come up with some kind of model and then we can use it to predict other situations? We're trying to recreate that experience all the time in what we do in the classroom so that the kids see science not just as a body of facts and figures, but as a human intellectual endeavor that's a creative process of building models and thinking about how does the world work and how do we best represent and communicate how the world works. And too often our science education misses out on that. With this method, teachers push students to develop a model and to answer a question. Students then experiment with their models and record the data. And the fact that they could use diagrams um, or maybe a graph to do something instead of equations, that, that helped a lot of the kids with the varying math abilities. Like a test question might say you can use equations or you can use the graph. It really reaches different learning styles that way. After making sense of their discoveries, the budding scientists present and discuss the results with their classmates. Although instructors guide students, modeling instruction flips the traditional teacher-student dynamic, and that can take some getting used to for everyone. We as teachers get so caught up in just we want to make sure that the students understand everything so we tell them and tell them and tell them over and over again but really the people who understand are always the people doing the talking so if we want students to understand we need to ask them to start doing the talking. It's no longer memorizing a body of facts it's actually doing science. I mean I heard them a couple of times can't we just have something to memorize can't we just have a worksheet I said nope that's not how it works and it was a little bit of a learning curve at, at first and then um, from there it just they, they really kind of got into it a lot more. From Oregon to Rhode Island there is a growing list of states adopting the next generation science standards a new set of benchmarks that reform science education and those leading the way in modeling instruction say the approach fits right in with the new focus on teaching students to think like scientists. When students feel as though they're going through those same experiments and they're reaching conclusions that these great scientists have made, that's what the most empowering part of modeling is because they feel as though they're coming up with these models and making achievements and like discoveries for themselves. As modeling instruction infiltrates more classrooms, teachers are pushing to raise their students' engagement in STEM and ultimately create a more competitive workforce for the future. We're trying to engage students in 21st century science that really in involves knowing enough foundation of science and enough ability to continue to learn science. Having students leave high school valuing and appreciating science is going to be extremely important to how open-minded they will be to, to become more educated about policy decisions or in jobs and just open-minded and not fearful of the science that is integrated with every uh, you know, profession that we have nowadays. That's all for now on SciTech Central. Thanks for watching.